Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the far distant future, things that won't happen until billions of years from now. I'm going to start by talking about the fate of our own sun, and then I'll talk about the fate of the Milky Way galaxy in which we live. Our sun is one of some hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. And then I'll talk about current scientific thinking on the ultimate fate of the entire universe. So let's go back to near the beginning. After the Big Bang, but before the first generation of stars, all the ordinary matter in the universe, the stuff that makes up atoms, the stuff that makes up you and me, consisted of about three quarters hydrogen by mass, one quarter helium, which was fused in the early minutes of the Big Bang from the hydrogen, and then tiny amounts of lithium, beryllium, and boron. There was no carbon, there was no nitrogen, there was no oxygen, nothing else beyond carbon in the periodic table existed yet. One of the most amazing things that human beings have ever learned about ourselves and our universe is that every atom in our bodies, except for the hydrogen, we don't have helium in our bodies, were formed inside the cores of stars billions of, sorry, yes, billions of years ago at temperatures of millions of degrees. And so that means that we are literally, not figuratively, but literally made of stardust. Now the sun formed from the collapse of a big cloud of interstellar gas and dust about 4.6 billion years ago. Like the universe as a whole, it was made mostly of hydrogen and helium. And the way that it gets the energy by which it shines, which is true for all ordinary stars, is by fusing hydrogen into helium via thermonuclear fusion in its core. Only in the core, not in the rest of the star, because only in the core is it hot enough about 15 million Kelvin, about 28 million Fahrenheit, for fusion to occur. Now the sun is certainly large, uh, it's very massive, but not infinitely so, and so that means it doesn't have an infinite supply of hydrogen fuel at its center. Eventually it's going to run out. Eventually means about 5 billion years from now. And what the sun is going to do when that occurs is pretty remarkable. So. Here we have a figure from 21st century astronomy. It's the textbook that I'm using for the introductory astronomy course I'm teaching at Ohio Wesleyan this semester. The publisher, W.W. Norton and Company, kindly gave me permission to use this in the next figure in my talk here. Uh, I want you to look first up here at the top is a representation of the sun as it is today as a main sequence star. That means it's still fusing hydrogen into helium inside of its core. This is a blown up version of it for clarity, but what I really want you to look at is down here, the big red orange thing there. That's what the sun is going to become after it runs out of hydrogen in its core. It's going to swell up until it's some 50 to 100 times bigger in diameter than it is now. It's going to become some 2,000 times brighter than it is now. It's going to be what astronomers call a red giant star. So that is in its correct relative size to the sun as it is today. It's going to become a monster of sorts. Now I hope you're wondering, why would running out of fuel make the sun swell up and become a monster like that? Well, it has to do with a balance of opposing forces. So the sun today represents a balance between the inward pull of gravity, trying to crush it under its own weight, and the outward push of, push, uh, push of pressure, which is counterbalancing that. Today, the sun is in a stable equilibrium between the two, and the way that's maintained is via those thermonuclear reactions of hydrogen into helium in its core. That keeps the core hot enough and at high enough pressure to support the weight of the layers above it. But when the sun runs out of fuel in its core, gravity is going to start getting the upper hand over pressure in the core. And so over a period of some 1.3 billion years, the core is going to shrink as a result of that. And that means it's going to be losing gravitational potential energy. But that energy doesn't just disappear from the universe, it gets converted into thermal energy, heat, and radiation. So the core is going to be getting hotter as this continues, and it will heat up the layer of unburned hydrogen, whoops, of unburned hydrogen surrounding the core, and it will continue fusing then hydrogen into helium in a thin shell surrounding the core, but much faster than in the core today because this shell will be at such a much higher temperature than the core is now. 
And it's the release of all that energy that will cause the sun to shine so much more brightly then, and also to increase the pressure in the sun's outer layers and cause them to swell up like that. Even the cockroaches are not going to survive this. So, uh, the sun will be at this point at the beginning of the end, but not at the end yet. It still will have some tricks up its sleeve. Uh, eventually, the contraction of the core, which will be inert helium, will make it hot enough, about 100 million Kelvin, to fuse car uh, helium into carbon and oxygen in its core. And so it will then have another source of nuclear energy, uh, helium fusing into carbon and oxygen in the core, hydrogen still fusing into helium surrounding the core. After 100 million years or so, it'll run out of helium fuel, and then the carbon-oxygen core will begin to contract and heat up. Helium fusion will continue in a cell surrounding the core. And then we'll have this. The sun will become a red giant for a second time. This time it will be called an asymptotic giant branch star. And it will be even more impressive than it was as a red giant the first time. More than 5,000 times brighter than it is now at its brightest. Even bigger than it was at a red giant. But it turns out that the helium burning shell will be unstable. And as a result of that, every few hundred thousand years, it will flare up and release lots and lots of energy. And the effect of that will be to puff the outer layers of the sun into space. And the sun will make one of these. This is what is known as the Ring Nebula in the constellation Lyra. It's a Hubble Space Telescope photograph. So this, is a, this was a star similar to the sun. You can see um, layers of material that were blown off the outer uh, portions of the star that are glowing. The reason they're glowing is because of fluorescence from ultraviolet light being emitted from this thing at the center. This is the burnt out core of the star made of carbon and oxygen fused from helium. At a high enough surface temperature, it's giving off lots of ultraviolet light, causing the material around it to glow. Now, that material in about 10,000 years or so, and I blink astronomically speaking, will fuse into the interstellar medium and just disappear. And all that's left will be the core at the center. That will be the final remnant of the sun, the burned out carbon oxygen core that was left over after it formed a nebula like this. And that object is what is known as a white dwarf which is remarkable indeed. If you were to take a teaspoonful of material from its surface, you would discover it's extremely dense because the sun as a white dwarf will have about half its current mass still left over, but it will only be about the size of the Earth. And that means it'll be so dense that a single teaspoonful of material from it would have about the mass of a UPS delivery truck. But because of its small size, all the mass being so concentrated, the gravity at the surface will be so strong that the weight of it, remember there's a difference between mass and weight, the weight is the gravitational force, the weight of that teaspoon would be about half a million UPS trucks worth. So what would it be like to stand on the surface of a white dwarf? Well, it wouldn't really be like anything. If you could get Scotty to beam you to the surface, before your neurons could communicate with one another, you would go and just get squashed flat and vaporized and you just become part of the white dwarf. So it's not like anything to stand on the surface of a white dwarf. Kind of incompatible with human existence. Okay, so that's the fate of the sun. What about of our galaxy? Well, it turns out that the sun's environment in its final years is going to be very different, cosmically speaking, from what it is now. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. Because we live inside of it, we can't see what it looks like from the outside, but astronomers can study it in enough detail to, to know that if we saw our own galaxy from the outside, it would look a lot like this one, NGC 6744. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across from one side to the other. So light traveling 670 million miles an hour would take 100,000 years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other. If you represent the distance from the Earth to the Sun as being two millimeters, then to that same scale, our galaxy would be the size of the actual Earth. It's enormous. Now this is the Andromeda galaxy, 
It's the nearest large spiral galaxy to our own spiral galaxy. It's actually a bit larger than ours, about 150,000 light years across. It's 2.5 million light years away. So the light that was used to make this photograph left the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years ago before our species had even evolved yet. Something to think about. Anyway, Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy, it turns out, observations show, are falling towards one another because of their mutual gravitational attraction. And in about four billion years, which note is sooner than the five billion years it'll take the sun to start becoming a red giant, the two galaxies are going to approach, collide, and merge with one another and form a different type of galaxy called an elliptical. And here is a video of a supercomputer simulation of that merger. You can see time here in the simulation at lower right, so it certainly speeds up time. Our galaxy does, in fact, rotate about four times every billion years. Now we zoom out, and here we see the Andromeda galaxy and a smaller spiral called the Triangulum that's near Andromeda. And so soon, well, in only a few billion years of simulated time, the two galaxies, the two large galaxies, will approach and begin to collide and merge. No stars will be harmed in this process. They're too far apart. But notice that many stars are carried off into intergalactic space uh, in what are known as tidal streams. And it's entirely possible that the sun will be in one of those tidal streams so that it will spend its final days all alone in intergalactic space. I sort of imagine it whimpering to itself. Or uh, it might remain part of the final elliptical galaxy that forms. But either way, the night sky is going to be very different when the sun is in its final stages than it is today. So what about the universe as a whole? Well, you've probably heard that the universe is expanding because the space between the galaxies is stretching out. That's a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Until the late 1990s, it was expected that the expansion of the universe was slowing down. It was thought that the gravity would be slowing the expansion down, but in 1998, two independent teams of astronomers both announced the same remarkable result. Those teams of astronomers were studying what are called type 1a supernovae. A type 1a supernova is an exploding white dwarf in a binary star system. Now, this is a relatively nearby type 1a supernova in a, another spiral galaxy called NGC 4526. So this is actually in the outer reaches of that galaxy. It's one of my favorite Hubble Space Telescope photographs. Uh, a type 1a supernova becomes 4 billion times brighter than the sun when it blows up. So that means we can see them across cosmic distances to billions of light years. And what these teams of astronomers were doing was studying the brightness of type 1a supernova in very distant galaxies. And what they both discovered was that the supernovae were fainter than they would be if the expansion of the universe had been slowing down. The reason they were fainter is because they were further away than they would be if the expansion of the universe were slowing down. The implication was that instead, the expansion of the universe is speeding up. We say that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Now, we can understand why the, ex the uh, expansion would accelerate, again, in terms of Einstein's theory of general relativity which predicts that if there's an energy intrinsically associated with empty space, it would act as a sort of negative gravity that would speed up the expansion instead of slow it down. And the name that astronomers have given to this energy is dark energy, both because we can't see it and because we're in the dark as to what it actually is. And since we don't know what it is, we don't know exactly what it's going to do in the future, but there are three possibilities which can be considered. So one possibility is that the dark energy is what we call a cosmological constant. Or in other words, the amount of dark energy per cubic meter stays constant as the universe expands. In that case, 
the universe's scale would continue to increase exponentially. Eventually, every galaxy outside our own would be moving away from us faster than the speed of light. What? I thought relativity said you can't have things move faster than the speed of light. Well, the, the speed of light is a speed limit on how fast things can travel through space, not on how fast things can move further apart because of the expansion of the space in between them. So eventually, our galaxy would be isolated from every other galaxy in the universe, uh, and then when all the stars have burned themselves out and all the black holes have evaporated, then the universe just becomes cold and dark and empty and more empty over time. Uh, and that's called the big freeze. Now, another possibility would be that the amount of dark energy per unit volume decreases over time. Maybe even it eventually becomes negative. And negative dark energy would act like positive gravity. It would slow down the expansion. So you could get a situation where the expansion of the universe eventually halts and then reverses direction so that the scale of the universe starts to diminish. And in a sort of reverse of the Big Bang, everything falls back together. And we have what we call the Big Crunch. And then finally, what if the dark energy increases with time? The amount per cubic meter keeps going up. Then you would get what we call a uh, uh, hyper-exponential uh, expansion of the universe. And in a finite amount of time, then the scale of the universe would become infinite. And just before the end, everything would get ripped apart, even atoms, even protons, and neutrons. And because everything would get ripped apart, that's called the big rip. Now, I can't resist the temptation to point out that uh, if you saw uh, Sean McCulloch's excellent talk earlier, you'll know why I say this. At, in, in any of these scenarios, at this point, all computer programs would cease to run. So in that sense, it's decidable. They're all going to stop running eventually. <laughs> ha, evil program. OK. <laughs> but in any case, uh, none of these scenarios is particularly rosy in terms of the continued existence of intelligent life. But the way I look at it is this. It's billions of years from now, for one thing. So you know, don't lose any sleep over it. And another thing is, I think that what it should do is make us appreciate even more the beauty and the majesty and the fireworks of the era of the universe in which we do find ourselves living. Thank you.